Welcome to Real Life Beyond Faith, where a formerly Christian, currently atheist couple takes a deep dive into the experience of life after deconversion. This is episode 22, and I'm your host, Jenica Crail. And I am your only host today, actually, because Patrick is not able to join me today. He is actually visiting a friend, and I will miss him dearly. But I have an interview today with Richard Carrier, so I'm not totally alone. It's kind of weird for me to record by myself, actually. I haven't really done this before. So Richard Carrier actually was in Cincinnati this weekend. Um, He had a pub meet at a bar in downtown Cincinnati. So I went to that. That was Saturday night. And then he actually um, stayed here with us. We had him in our spare room because now our house has a spare room, which is really cool. So it was really cool getting to hang out with him and get to know him a little bit. And we recorded, well, he and I recorded this interview. So hope you guys enjoy it. I think it was really good. The stuff we talked about was very fascinating and I really enjoyed this one. And I think you guys will too. Um, His books are very well written very well researched and definitely worth looking into. Um, He has a number of books. You can find them all on his website, which will be in the description box. Um, It's richardcarrier.info, I-N-F-O. So you can go there if you want to check out more of what he's done. So for anyone who's not familiar with who Richard Carrier is, he's a historian, philosopher, and an author. He's Like I said, he's written several books, Um, and one of the things that he's most well-known for, or the thing that he's most well-known for, is his book on the historicity of Jesus. That's the title, On the Historicity of Jesus, where he talks about the mythicist um, position of whether or not it's actually a valid argument to say that we're not totally sure that Jesus even existed as a physical person. Um, He is one of the only people who's actually put together an argument for that that isn't ridiculous. (laughs) Um, I've read his book and it is very fascinating. It's interesting to listen to uh, the research that he's put into this and the conclusions that he came to based on his research. And he's done um, several talks about it, too, around the country. He went on, uh, I think, a four-month tour this year and talked about um, the findings of his book and such. Very fascinating stuff. And um, like he says in his interview, he is the only one who has put together an argument like this that actually is peer-reviewed. So it's very fascinating. You'll have to check out the book if you're interested in that topic or, you know, interested in uh, looking into that question. I personally find history to be absolutely fascinating. So it was really cool to get to spend some time with him and kind of pick his brain about some things and hear about his research and what brought him to this field and this area of expertise. So without further ado, here's my interview with Richard Carrier after this short break. Have y'all ever wondered what it's like to be a redneck with empathy? Have you never heard of a Southerner who isn't a blathering bigot? Well, have I got the show for you. It's the Podunk Polymath Podcast, hosted by myself, Chris, and it's the sentiments of a secular, sarcastic, screwed-up Southern us, JW, and skeptic. You can find me and the show on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or your favorite podcatcher. Y'all stop on by and take it easy now, okay? Hey, all you listeners, I'm Robert. And I'm Amy from Secular Yakking. And we just wanted to let you know that if you've got 30 minutes to kill, then we're the podcast for you. We're just some old married couple who's been yakking at each other over the many years. And we thought we should start making it so you can listen in on our yakking. We dig past the mainstream and bring you the news that you may or may not have heard about. We take a look at politics, religion, science, and pretty much anything we feel like yakking about and sharing it with you. And let us not forget our weekly Mr. Potter Award. No, we're not professionals on anything we talk about, but we love to yak about stuff and give you our opinion on the matter. 
So tune in at secularyacking.com or check out our feed on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and anywhere good podcasts can be heard. And who knows what craziness will happen. (laughs) Yeah, just like this. So I'm here today with Richard Carrier, and he's actually in studio with me, which is awesome and quite an honor. Um, Sadly, Patrick's not here with us today, but um, we're going to talk a little bit about what you do, Richard, and Mm -hmm. um, then a little bit about your background. So can you tell me a little bit about yourself and what kind of got you into um, what you do now as a historian and author? Yeah, sure. Um, I have My life has two tracks, really. One is philosophy and the other is ancient history. And the philosophy is my religious backstory, which I'll get to because uh, that's your next question about that. And, and it led to me wanting to pursue philosophy as my religion. So that I'm, I'm interested in answering philosophical questions, not just the history of philosophy, but actually like solving philosophical problems and figuring out what are my answers to these deep questions about how we know what we know and things like that. So I, one track of my life is that is like, uh, so for example, my book, Sense and Goodness Without God, is mostly about what atheists should believe rather than what we don't believe. And a lot of people mostly write about what we don't believe. Whereas I said, well, what about all the things, what do we do believe about how we know what we know? How, right. what, we, what do we think beauty is? What do we, uh, how do we build our moral view on, on what foundation? Um, what do we think exists? You know, what is the nature of reality? All of these questions, if you approach them without the supernatural and only a science-based basis, you know, factual basis, what do you end up with? Uh, and there's a lot of interesting questions there that some you know, people haven't thought through. And so I th- thought them through as best I could and pr- published that book which gives a complete worldview from an atheist point of view. And I think the best value of that is even if you don't agree with its conclusions, it at least shows you a model for how to do this yourself. Right. And so that's one side that I encourage people to do is to become philosophers, like try to figure out these philosophical problems and realize why they're important and how you want to make them coherent with each other and fact, factually based and science based. So that that was driven by my religious background and, and is really my religion now is like seeing it as secular philosophy is my religion. And in that sense, I'm very devout because uh, mm-hmm. I, <laughs> I really uh, focus on this a lot. And I write about philosophy on my blog a lot too. That's one track. But the other is ancient history. So most of my work is in ancient history and it serves different models but uh, purposes, but mostly it is counter apologetics uh, trying to answer the basically the lies and misinformation that Christians spread about history. Like all of it. <laughs> yeah, uh, for Basically. the benefit of atheists, yeah. Uh, in, um, yeah, it, my specialty is ancient history. So uh, mostly I do, you know, Roman Empire, Greco-Roman period, um, New Testament origins, origins of Christianity. Right, which I find that absolutely fascinating too. I just do, t- yeah, I always end up doing, uh, as I'm writing these books, I'm fascinated by the background facts more than I am about like the, the actual right. <laughs> the thing that I'm working on. I imagine that would be a fun thing to study. It is, and that's uh, that's what I fell in love with. Uh, when I went, uh, after I finished my tour in the Coast Guard, uh, I went to college, and I didn't really have a clear idea of what I was going to do. I was doing all the undergrad requirements for uh, upper division, and so before I had to pick a major, I was just doing everything, but sampling mm-hmm. some majors. And I went in, because uh, I was a sonar tech in the Coast Guard, I had uh, 12 college units of electronics engineering mm-hmm. uh, from the Coast Guard training I received, and I really liked mathematics. It got me into it again. I had burned out on academics before that. It's one of the reasons I ended up in the Coast Guard. Uh, but now I was like, hungry again. I was falling in love with, with academics and studying, and so I was, I was back in. And so, but when I went to do math, a math major, I found math really boring. And so I was like, you know, uh, later I found math very exciting when I studied the history of it and the concepts like the, that, that made math more exciting. But when you're doing like the, you have to know all of these, you have to take all these math courses and and basically become a human computer. And I was like, I don't need to be a human computer. We have computers. (laughs) (laughs) So that, that was burning me out. I was like, I don't like this. Uh, And then I figured, well, I like language and grammar and things like that. So I'll do like literature. I'll do English. And they made you read all these boring novels. And I was like, I don't like this either. (laughs) But in the meantime, while I'm doing all of that, I'm doing all the undergrad requirements. So, you know, you do all the sciences, you know, the whole breadth requirements. I'm doing history and all of that, multiple history courses. And I fell in love with history just in general. Um, So I I studied, you know, Native American history, uh, U.S. history, African history. Like, I'm, you know, doing a bunch of different things, plus the standard Western Civ 1 and Western Civ 2, which everyone Mm -hmm. has to take. 
And uh, and the big difference was in high school, it was memorization, names and dates, memorization. It was super yep. boring. And if I someone said, that. yeah, if someone told me when I graduated high school that I was going to be a PhD historian, uh, and I'd be like, there's no way. <laughs> like, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was in college, it was different. Uh, it was taught cause and effect. Why did these things happen? Uh, and it was taught uh, a method, like how do we know these things happen? So these those were way more interesting questions. Yeah. Plus, they could talk about much more things that happened in history that parents won't let teachers teach their kids. Uh, so you find yeah. a lot more interesting stuff uh, in in college. Sex so, and death. Sex and death. It's all yeah. It's all sex and death. Uh, yeah. Or even things that aren't either of those things, but people think kids will find boring. You know, mm-hmm. I, I had mentioned in a uh, conversation earlier uh, that. Um, uh, the, the history of riots, like in the U.S., you think, well, that'd be really boring. Kids wouldn't like that. So actually, they would love that because okay. it touches on social justice issues. It touches on the history of this country. Definitely. Trying to explain why these riots occurred in the historical context of them, you learn tons of stuff about history. You learn tons of stuff about the U.S. and uh, and a lot of that stuff contradicts, you know, the, the patriotic narrative of how wonderful we are, right? So, yeah. Um, and and yes, that was drilled into our heads, like how. Yeah. You know, yeah. great our country is when we're right, in school, right. and then it's not till afterwards when you actually do your own research. Yeah, and you're like, holy we're shit, we did, some horrible, <laughs> we did some horrible things. Why did they paint such a pretty yeah, picture for yeah, us? Yeah, yeah, wounded knee, Tuskegee, like this, <laughs> come on, man. Uh, yeah, so, um, but anyway, yeah, so it was much more interesting uh, studying history. So I fell in love yeah. with history, and I really fell in love with the unit on Roman society, ancient mm. Rome. And it's like, I really love this. This would be great. And at the same time, I had gradually been getting more involved in the atheism movement. And I realized that I could kill two birds with one stone. I could do something I was really passionate about. Plus, uh, you know, Greco-Roman studies would give me the, the cultural background and the languages to actually do counter apologetics and help atheists out by, you know, pointing out when the Christian tells you the Greek says something, I can say, no, it doesn't. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I saw that it With would make confidence right. too, because it would be, you know be something that like, would make me useful to the atheist community. And no one else was doing it at that time. I didn't know any other atheists were getting PhDs in ancient history. Um, at least not, uh, I mean, outspoken atheists who participate in the movement and write about it. Uh, obviously, right. there are atheists in that field, but they don't purpose, you know, do stuff for yeah, atheist audiences. Yeah, they're not like, actually involved. Yeah. Uh, since then, you know, we've got Hector Avalos uh, as a good example. He's mostly the Old Testament, but he does New Testament as well. Um, he's a prominent atheist who writes for atheist audiences and this stuff. So uh, I'm not alone anymore. Uh, yeah. Matthew Ferguson is getting a PhD in that field now. Um, Raphael Letaster just got one. So now there's bunches of us. Like that. So I've got yeah. all my replacement peeps already, <laughs> <laughs> already in a row, uh, although Av- Avalos preceded me. But, um, the, so you uh, see them as like, you know... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, like comrades or something rather than competition. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, so yeah, I, no, I like that mindset. Like, thing, like yeah. we're working together. We're not working against yeah. each other. Uh, well, especially because there's so much water to carry. You yeah, can't carry exactly. it all. So uh, one of the greatest joys I have as a historian is when I'm thinking of something like, why, why didn't someone write about this? And mm-hmm. then I go find that someone did a brilliant research you know, product on it. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Now I don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah. And this is great. Now I can just point people to it. So I just love yeah, those discoveries. Yeah. So I love it when we can divide Much labor and, and a lot mm-hmm. of us do things. Um, yeah, and everyone's going to have a slightly different spin on it or like their own specialties. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And like and they'll see things that you didn't. Different. It's, yeah. Uh, areas of expertise. Correct. Yeah. Such. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, like Avalos, for example, is a he- he- expert in Hebrew and I, I am not, you know, I'm a right. Greek, but, um, so, so that's what got me into that. And then, you know, it was really just contingency that bounced me around into what projects I was doing. So for instance, when I uh, ended up in, uh, getting my PhD at Columbia university, uh, I had to pick a dissertation subject, and the the subject I I picked and be- was because of Christian apologetics. There was this argument going around that people were asking me about because I knew ancient history. But these cr- these Christians or a number of prominent ones argue that Christianity is necessary for modern science. That the pagans had a mm-hmm. mental block, uh, they had, their philosophy was all messed up. There's no way they could do science. And it's like even as a non specialist in ancient science at the time, just ancient science, or ancient historian in general, I knew that was ridiculous. Right. <laughs> uh, and so, I, but it does it does lead to an interesting question. A lot of these Christian apologetics uh, in philosophy and history, like there's their own bullshit that they're trying to fob on you, but there's usually some interesting question in there as well that's unrelated to it that I find fascinating. And, uh, and this one is, why didn't the scientific revolution occur in the ancient world? Uh, mm-hmm. That's an interesting question. If Christianity yeah, didn't is. even exist or would Christian apologists didn't exist, it wouldn't matter. It would still be an interesting question. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it turns out there's some work on this. So uh, there's a lot of differing opinions no one could agree. So I assembled and you know, did a bibliography, studied all the different theories that were out there 
there, um, both Christian and secular, and uh, built a dissertation that was going to be on why didn't the scientific revolution happen in the Roman Empire? That was my idea for my dissertation. And I took it to my advisor, and my advisor read it over and said, you know, that that's 10 dissertations. <laughs> you need to pick one. And yeah, so I. Uh, <laughs> that would take so long. <laughs> yeah. So I picked um, the attitudes. So I, my dissertation was attitudes towards the natural philosopher in the early Roman Empire. Mm. Uh, natural philosopher is their term for the closest thing I had to a scientist. Right. And so I did that, and that ended up, I had to end up studying ancient science thoroughly. So I became a specialist in ancient science, but I'm also doing it from the religious angle. So I was also an expert in Christian intellectual history. Uh, and at the same time, I'm doing my dissertation. I'm doing all this other work uh, in for the atheist movement. Like uh, I became an expert in resurrection apologetics. So I know tons mm -hmm. about the Bible, the New Testament, uh, the origin of the resurrection story, resurrection beliefs among Christians, and all of these things. Is that when you things. started debating? Uh, you know, I can't remember my, f well, my first real debate was exactly on this subject. It was, uh, me and Mike Lacona, Resurrection of Jesus, Veritas Forum at mm -hmm. UCLA to an audience of 500. Uh, and, uh, that, that's an interesting debate because I, I, I came very well prepared and, and it didn't go well for him, but <laughs> yeah, there was, it was your first debate. It was too. my first debate. I over-prepared for it, which was uh, good. Uh, um, uh, at the time I, I assembled 99 slides, uh, and I'd researched him in advance. I researched mm -hmm. what are arguments because I saw his debate with Bart, uh, with, um, Dan Barker. Okay. And so I researched the kinds of questions he asked and some of them were things I wouldn't have expected. Uh, and, but I, so I prepared slides for everything and I had them all numbered. Uh, and I would, at this time with the technology that was available, I had to have uh, my then wife uh, in the audience. I would just say, say, bring up slide 32 and then she would key in the slide and it would yes. come up. And uh, there's, there was an argument there. There's a moment in there when he tries to do his gotcha moment. And, and I saw this with <laughs> Dan Barker too, where he asked me like, well, what are your qualifications? What are even are your qualifications in ancient Greek? And I said, so, bring up slide 52, please, or whatever number it was. And it comes up with this massive list of you know, uh -huh. my qualifications in ancient Greek. And I mean, they're really impressive. He's like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by that point, the audience is laughing because this kept happening. He would yeah. make an argument and they'd be like, ooh, gotcha. He didn't plan for that. And it, slide whatever, please. And it comes up like, how did he know? Uh, and there's a moment when the moderator even says uh, uh, to, to my opponent, uh, Mike Lacona, he says, I, I think you're going to need some more slides. Like, <laughs> So yeah, that went really well. Um, I'm really, you know, I've gotten better even at, at how I do debates. I'm, I'm good at debating. I don't like debating because they're very, you know, very nerve wracking because you're under the clock yeah. and you, you don't want to like misstate something. And it's like it's it's and you, they're gonna try rhetoric and pull shit right. on you. And it's it's not it's not fun, but I'm good at it, so I'll do it. So if people hire me to debate, I'll debate. But um, I don't but you'd like, rather like give talks and things. I would like rather that. give talks, or if we're going to do a debate, do a written debate where you both have time to like research the facts and and figure out best word count for you know, within word count and yeah, how to rebut it best. So where you have time to think about it, uh, yeah. and then you have a much more thoughtful debate. I think um, that those are the kind of debates I prefer. The um, so anyway, yeah. So that was how I got into that, and so I got a lot of skill and knowledge in ancient history as it relates to origins of religion, history of philosophy. Uh, for my dissertation, my for my Master of Philosophy, which is the all but dissertation degree at uh, Columbia, I had to have four majors. So I did uh, historiography, which is ancient historians and their methods. Um, I did uh, Fall of the Roman Empire, which uh, turns out to was really boring. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, philosophy, so intellectual history. So I did intellectual history and. Um, I think religious history. Yeah, so I did. Uh, so those are the the majors that those I did. That sounds so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I loved it. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the the four hour uh, committee oral exam was terrifying, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think so. and prepping for it was that was like the most difficult and nerve wracking experience months of my life preparing for that, yeah. but. Um, but I love doing it, and so that's what I love writing about. Uh, and so I write about ancient science. My latest books are about ancient science, but I also do Origins of Christianity. I'm also well known as the one guy who's passed an argument that Jesus didn't exist through peer review, like no one had done that before. There's a lot of crank right. arguments, that are terrible arguments for that position on yeah. the internet. Which makes the idea of mythicism sound exactly. ridiculous. Exactly, especially if you hear like things like Joseph Atwill's like wild conspiracy theories yeah. and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so no, I figured out, like, I looked at it and said, well, if we limited all the crappy stuff, is there an argument left over? Uh, or is the evidence really tipped towards historicity? Mm -hmm. and, and I found that the more I looked at it, the more the historicity looked dubious, actually. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm renowned for that. So on the historicity of Jesus is the, the key book on that, that, that sort right. of at least uh, opened up a serious argument uh, for that position. Uh, it's mostly 
And very being ignored detailed or lied too. About. I yes. read that one. I'm like, man. <laughs> yeah, well, that <laughs> was the really thing. You really did your research. Yeah. Uh, well, That's I was awesome. paid to. Um, it was basically mm-hmm. a postdoc research grant that my fans generated for me to say, we don't care what your an- the answer is. We just want this to yeah. exist. And yeah. so, That's fantastic. Uh, so I did that. I, I spent six years doing it, and I wanted to make sure it would pass peer review. So I wanted to make sure it was really high quality, mm-hmm. really thorough, that it didn't leave anything out. It didn't, you know, uh, all the citations were there, the evidence was there, and, and all of that. And then it would, you know, pass professional peer review of their yeah. own, you know, opinions is regarding what meets the qualities of the field, uh, the expectations of quality for the field. So um, so I did that, and that's why it is such a large, detailed book. I, I, I am planning a smaller pop market version, but, but mm-hmm. obviously it can't contain everything. Kind of like David uh, Fitzgerald's, like... You know, smaller books on the same subject. Yeah, and like then he has the huge three volumes. Easier to read yeah. for the lay public. <laughs> yes, uh, Nailed, yeah. for example. Um, yeah, that's uh, – but yeah, so I'm going to do something like that cool. eventually. But uh, right now it's the – this, and even that, people, if you – you know, you're always going to look at the basic summary of, you know, this pop market version. So you're going to argue with some part of it and you go, well, okay, but then you're, now you're going to do a deep dive now. You have to go to the academic yeah. book where you have the detail. In right. It. And it's nice that you already have that one. Yes. So you don't have to, like, write that book to Correct. answer all yeah. the detailed yeah, questions yeah. that you get. From yeah, so I do it the other oh, way around. Yeah. Uh, it's more similar That's to smart. Bart Ehrman's series. He, he wrote Forged for the pop market, right? Uh, which is a really good book, by the way. It's a really good mm-hmm. summary if you want to know why we believe there are forgeries in the New Testament. Uh, that one blew my mind. I yeah. read that as a Christian. Oh, like, really? That was one of the ones that I read <laughs> when I was like going through the deconversion process. Mm-hmm. Like I started with um, Jesus Interrupted. Yes, that's a really forged. good one too. I, I always recommend Jesus Interrupted blown away. and I recommend Forged. Those are really good books. Mm-hmm. But he also at the same time, he came out with, or near the same time, uh, Forgery and Counterforgery uh, in early Christianity or something like that, which is the serious detailed academic book. Um, mm-hmm. So so he has the pop market version, but you say like, well, I don't know, it's not rigorous enough. Like, okay, look, there's a peer reviewed yeah. like detailed version you can go deep dive into if you're not you know, happy with the pop market summary. Uh, that's what I'm planning to do. So I'll have cool. the... You know, on the history of City of Jesus is the deep dive, and then now I'm going to develop a pop market version of it. Cool. When do you think you'll be doing that? Uh, well, that's scheduled to write this year, so really? uh, yeah, oh, cool. yeah. <laughs> Look forward to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm doing. I'm going to do a pop market version of that and Sense and Goodness without God as well. So oh, cool. Yeah. So th- those are uh, um, under contract or nearly under contract uh, for this year. So that will be. Those will be the books I'll be occupying me. I don't know if I'll get them both out this year, but. Um, one or the other. Let me know when they do come out, and I'll spread the word. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to be on again to yeah, talk about absolutely. any subject for absolutely. sure. Um, but your second question was my religious background, yeah. right? So um, yeah, and I want to know like what what made you want to get into the atheism movement once mm-hmm. you became an atheist? Because that's always fascinating yeah. to me. Because there are people who just become an atheist and they're just like, yeah, whatever, I'll go about my daily life. And then there are those of us who are like, ah, I want to do something about this. Mm-hmm. So tell me about that too. Yeah, yeah. I, You know, contrary, everybody assumes, like for most atheists, and for me, they assume that we all come from fundamentalist Christian backgrounds and we're just backlashing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't like have Like myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't have that experience. I had. Yeah. I was raised by a super liberal Christian family. I wasn't expected to believe anything, so I didn't really I didn't have faith in Christianity. I just I went to church and Sunday school and stuff just because that's what our family did. But it was such a liberal church that they taught like Bible stories next to Greek myths and didn't even say that there was a difference. It was all about the moral of the story. It wasn't didn't matter whether it was true or not. That wasn't the point. You know, it was that that kind of liberal Christianity. It was more about community. It was more about like so serve you know community service. It wasn't really about uh, you know browbeating you with the morality of the Bible or so creationism or any of that. Me. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'm like wait, what? People are often astonished when I tell that. Yes, no, the Christians A like that exist. Where they don't like yeah <laughs> pound it into your head and yeah. you're bleeding out your ears. Yes, yes. No, it's a re- it's a real thing. Um, so uh, so I did that, but I became kind of sort of a deist you know, semi-agnostic deist kind of uh, out of that. But uh, in high school, uh, and I was about 15 or 16, I think, um, I had a religious experience that convinced me that Taoism was true. And so I became a really, it was my first true faith I became a, a devout Taoist. Uh, Are you comfortable sharing that experience? Uh, I write about it in Sense and Goodness Without God, actually. Okay. So uh, yeah, for people who want yet. the whole story, yeah, it's, I, I tell my, my background in there. So people want the full details okay. of it. It's in there. Um, and that was a thing where it was all of the things that were convincing me it was true had scientific explanations uh, right. if you just understood the background of things. Like if you understand how altered states of consciousness work, how hallucination works, how coincidences really aren't all that amazing. Uh, you know, if yeah. you look at 
how math and statistics work. They can be so convincing though, <clears throat> yes. in that moment That's and right. when you're experiencing it. Yeah, yeah. And you think and there's you no way. If you don't know. Yeah, you would think there's no way this yeah. can happen by chance. This had to be by design. Right, there has exactly. to be some sort of great force that's that's doing this. And there it, are still things that happen to me like that these days, mm-hmm. and I'm just like, holy crap! If this would have happened when I was still a Christian, <laughs> I'd be like, wow, God is really moving in my life. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, no, exactly right. And for me, I'd be like, wow, the Dow following the Dow really works. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. same same thing. It's yeah, it's a different su- right. It's a different supernatural assumption that explains it. Um, and also, like, it really transformed my life and made me a much happier person and much more at peace person. So, mm-hmm. and that's what you often hear from religious people, too, is like, well, it right. made me, you know, obviously it must be true because it transformed me and made me a better or person. Or useful in some way. Right, yeah. And Taoism was the same. So, it was, it's it, that actually gave me perspective on this because uh, I could actually point to people like, all the things you're saying about your religion is what I felt about mine. So, how do you mm-hmm. know... I'm the one who was wrong and not you. Like It's the same, right? So that was one aspect of it. But what happened is when I graduated high school, now in high school I met the occasional Christian fundamentalist and they were just people we thought were funny. Uh, I remember a friend of mine, his girlfriend was, she fundamentalist girlfriend, was in tears over the fact that uh, he believed that there was life on other planets and that meant he was oh, going to hell. Oh my God. And it was like, that is the weirdest thing to think. Yeah. And so we just thought that was a joke. And, it's just, and to get so emotionally worked up correct. over it. Correct, yeah, yeah. That's part of what makes me so mad about my background because right. it's like I was so emotionally worked up over things that I didn't need to be. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and it's think, one of the things that made me real angry when I yeah, came out of it. And, you know, that's like, the perspective uh, I have now is, you know, grown up. But <laughs> back then we yeah. just thought, oh, how silly and stupid this yeah, is. Exactly. And you don't think like step back like, that's just really sad. Like, yeah. you know, the, you have sympathy for people who are put into this position by their delusions and exactly. their culture and their society is sort of forcing that onto them. But – once I graduated uh, high school, I was now a voting citizen and I started getting involved in politics. And that's when I encountered Christian fundamentalism for real, right? So that's right. when every single political issue I believed in was fighting for who everyone who was standing in my way every single time, Christian fundamentalists. Uh, yep. And so that got me more involved in that. And so I got more engaged in debating them online you know, back when the early forum days, mm-hmm. you know, when AOL and People Network and these things that you know don't exist anymore um, – <laughs> were the places to go for these kinds of things. And uh, so I was very much involved in that. And that got me more and more interested in argument. That's another thing. So like uh, figuring out like, why is this person not un- believing or no, why is this person not changing their conclusion when I've got the facts and logic, right? Yeah. So I got more into studying how people think and, and how, how what is a better way to construct an argument and what even are you trying to accomplish with constructing an argument for a conclusion? Got more and more involved in that. And in the then eventually I joined the Coast Guard. It was several years later. Uh, I joined the Coast Guard and I, I went in as a Taoist, uh, a devout Taoist. Um, and, but in the course of the Coast Guard, I was still studying uh, other Chinese philosophies. I was studying Confucianism and Taoism. In, in China, uh, they are actually arguments against each other. Taoism is a reaction against Confucianism. Oh, interesting. And the I Confucians and the Taoists, they have, they, they bait each other. They have different views on things. And so... Uh, that and plus I was con- always studying science. I kept studying science. And um, so what happened was I started to realize that my altered states of consciousness, you know, my, my hallucinatory experiences through meditation and sleep deprivation were all scientifically explicable. Yeah. Uh, it was just confirmation bias in the sense that my brain was creating the experiences that I wanted to have that verified mm-hmm. Taoism. It's a circular argument if you step back and think about it. Uh, anybody who says that they're, you know, talking, they're being inspired by the Holy Spirit or talking to Jesus, it's it's a circular argument. Like you're, you're hearing what you want to hear. You're telling yourself what you want. Yeah. It's just your opinion that you're saying comes from Jesus. It's like, you know? Yeah, it's like a thought that pops into your mind and Correct. you're like, oh, that's, oh, that's God. Jesus. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I'm and familiar with that. Right. <laughs> right. The same thing. So um, did you let go of those beliefs easily or was that really hard for you? I, it wasn't hard. It was perplexing more than anything. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that was because... My Taoism was based on my own experience, and I didn't have a culture or a society uh, ready to punish me for right. questioning or changing. Right? If anything, they would be like relieved if I. Yeah. Like, so, <laughs> so I didn't have that social pressure uh, where I'm going to lose my social network. I'm going to be vilified. I'm going to, you know, there's going to be social consequences to changing my point of view. I didn't have to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, I could just look at it as, oh. Okay, what, what do the, does this hold up against the facts? You know, like, you really see it more objectively. It made it easier for me. Mm-hmm. And um, and the, also the Confucians. I started to realize the Confucians were sometimes right and the Taoists were sometimes right and the Taoists were sometimes wrong and so on. And I was like, this is just human philosophy. It's not, yeah. it's not like divinely true or it's not like you know, supernaturally true. 
so I, I lost my faith uh, in Taoism, but I was still kind of like a semi-believer. I was a seeker, the, the, the Christian missionaries will say, right? Gotcha. And uh, I was on, uh, I was at a Navy base. Uh, I had been sent to do some training. I think for that was the torpedo uh, fire, torpedo fuel firefighting school <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> that I went to. Uh, it was either that or helicopter torpedo loading. It was one of the other uh, courses I was taking. So I was on the Navy base doing that, and the sailor walks up to me and says, have you found Jesus? And this happens on military bases, if you know. They're always walking mm-hmm. around evangelizing people who look lonely sitting on a curb or something. Uh-huh. And uh, and I, I explained, like, well, actually, I'm a Taoist, and the Tao actually governs all things. Even, even gods have to conform their uh, selves to the Tao. So you know, the Tao is actually superior to everything else so i'm already covered right <laughs> he's like you poor pig <laughs> <laughs> well it confused him he's like he had uh-huh. no response p- planned for this so he had to, he flipped the script <laughs> to another planned thing because you know they always have these planned scripts for these right and he says well have you read the bible i said well i read bits of it when i was a kid and it's like well, what? well if you haven't read it you can't decide right and it's like well that's true yeah yeah and he says well if i give you a bible will you promise to read it and i was like i totally will uh, and so he gave me, you know, this NIV student Bible, uh, this paperback, uh, and uh, Old Testament new. And I think I spent like three days. I had uh, you know time in my barracks and stuff, and it's just reading the Bible cover to cover, Old Testament new. And I remember when I turned the last page of the first, of the New Testament and read it to the end, and I, I said out loud in the barracks alone, "Yep, I'm an atheist." <laughs> Yeah, reading yes. the Bible will do that too. And then that's, yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, my Coast Guard buddies who were Christians, uh, some of them were Christians. Um, so I, you know, I told my Coast Guard buddies about, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I don't think God exists. I think I'm an atheist. And I was starting to get a little like, like militant, but I thought I was kind of alone. I was, one thing I was doing was looking for books about it at, at bookstores. And then back then it was almost impossible to find this stuff. I had to go to like a used bookstore to find Corliss Lamont and Bertrand Russell, you know, <laughs> these, you know, why I'm not a Christian and uh, the philosophy of humanism, like these really old used books. It was, was hard that to find like stuff. before the God delusion? Oh, and yeah, all yeah. That? Oh, this is okay. 10 years before, more gotcha. than 10 years. I mean, this, this is, we're talking 1992. Oh, yeah. So, so um, like nothing. yeah, this is right. It was really hard to find stuff. And, um, and also the internet was very low scale at that point. So, like, you, it wasn't easy to find atheism on the internet either. I mean, the secular web didn't even get created until, like, I think 1995, right? Uh, and so um, the secular web being inter- infidels.org, which was the first big warehouse for atheist stuff. So when mm-hmm. people would go online looking for atheism, that was one of the first ma- you know doorways to it. So um, so yeah, so it's the time I was at the Castro Street Fair in San Francisco with my Coast Guard buddies, and and uh, my Christian Coast Guard buddies uh, stopped me and said, "Hey, look, there's a booth. It says American Atheists. That's you." <laughs> and he was so excited that he found something for me. Yeah, that's so cool. And so I. Uh, I went to the booth, and that's how I found American Atheists, and that got me realizing, oh, there's there's organizations, like there's this is a thing. And so I got more and more involved in the movement that way. Got more, uh, as I, after I left the Coast Guard, immediately went into college and started acquiring skills and knowledge that I could apply. And th- that's what got me into it. And what the motivation was, was really I just love knowledge and I love teaching, and uh, I I get really angry with lies and stupidity, mm. and so if I can correct something like that feels good. Like I see like yeah. that, that is a stupid thing that's factually false, and you're spreading factually false information, uh, and what you're saying is illogical. I'm gonna write this down. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> let's write this to people. And really, what happened was uh, I, would, I would do keep doing these bulletin board arguments, you know, debates and stuff, and. And people would often ask me questions. And then I became uh, editor-in-chief of it. I became the feedback editor and then editor-in-chief of the secular web. And that got me much more involved in, like, building documents and warehousing them and things. But a lot of what was it was was people asking me questions. Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Right? And, uh, and I'd give an answer and I'd research the answer and stuff. And I realized, like, God, I'm getting asked the same questions over and over again. Why don't I just write an essay and then just, just go read the essay? Like, so that I don't have to keep <laughs> right. repeating myself. And that's how I got into writing, frankly, is let's just – Solving this time management problem is like I'll just do one good essay on it and just point everybody there, and then I don't have to answer over and over again. Yeah, uh, and then that led to books that do the same thing. It's like, like, why don't you think Jesus existed? Well, I wrote a whole book just for the specific purpose of answering that question, and I already know that if I give you an answer, you're going to 
ask like 10 other questions, guess what? They're, they're already answered in the book. In the book. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're going to ask 10 more questions. I already know what they are. They're already answered in the book. And you go, like, why is this book 700 pages? Because I know what you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I've had this conversation. Yeah, exactly. A I've had times. That's right. That's right. Yeah, Aaron yeah. Raw did the same thing. He's like, well, I get asked the same questions over and over again about evolution. So I'm just doing a whole series on YouTube and I'll just point them to specific that's videos. Right. Like, okay, you have this question, you go to this video. Yes. This because he's just tired of answering some yeah, yeah, that's questions right. over and over. Yeah, so that, that's it. it it's, um, I mean, part of it is the politics, right? Uh, fundamentalism and Christianity are getting in the way. And not just their views, they're also their epistemology. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the ways of knowing that le keep them Christian are ways of knowing that they're applying to other aspects of life, even independently right. of their religion. Yes. And that's a problem. And so I'm very much interested, interested in critical thinking and how to get people to think better regardless yeah. of their religion. It just so happens that if you think better, you start to not be religious. Uh, it's just a yeah, causal consequence of that. Yeah, when you stop placing so much value on believing something on faith mm -hmm. and realize how important evidence is and how important, like, the truth is. Like, it seems like a lot of my Christian friends just really don't care so much what is true, but rather uh, what feels good, what they like. <laughs> like. I have some friends who have literally said, like, I don't want to look into this stuff because yeah. I don't want to find out that I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. oh like, my but gosh. the truth is important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And especially like if you don't, if you don't do that in your political reasoning, you're, you're going to harm people. Like you're mm -hmm. going to make, you're going to make voting choices for candidates and laws uh, that you think are right because you refuse to look into the facts of the case right. and you're going to end up harming people inadvertently. And I, exactly. I think if you fashion yourself or imagine yourself a good person, um, you wouldn't want to do that. You'd want exactly. to take more responsibility and make sure you're right about this stuff. Absolutely. Well, it looks like we're nearing our time. A couple minutes past. Very good. <laughs> so do you want to point people to where they can find your stuff and your blog and all that? Yes. Everything is at richardcarrier.info. That's dot .info. So just one word, Richard Carrier. Dot info that has my blog it has you from there you can find my twitter account my facebook account where you can follow Perfect. me on facebook uh links to all my books where you can buy them book recommendations um in the blog you can look at the categories list and click classes and you can see my online classes that i teach every month on both philosophy and ancient history and you can see what the latest one is uh, and maybe take a course where you get to actually ask an expert that you've paid to answer in detail mm -hmm. <laughs> for a month That's so awesome. you get to earn my attention uh, in detail on these <laughs> subjects so i do that and everything else you'd want to know about me uh you can access through richardcarrier.info awesome and i'll put that in the description of this cool. show as well right on well thanks for being here yeah thank Appreciate you it. So that was my interview with Richard Carrier. I think it was a very interesting look into his life and kind of how he got started um, with his delve into ancient history and philosophy and why he does what he does. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I definitely did. And uh, you can check out his website by going to the description box and clicking on the link, or you can just visit richardcarrier.info so check them out um, now I would like to thank our amazing patrons if you'd like to become a patron you can go to patreon.com slash real life beyond faith that is also in the description box that's a great way to help support us in what we're doing and to you know help us update our equipment, go to conferences, and do all the activisty things that we love to do. And we greatly appreciate our patrons. And we hope that you decide to uh, help us out a little bit in that area. There are some amazing people who are already doing so. If you're not in the financial situation where you can help us financially, I completely understand that. And in that case, if you would still like to support us, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can give us five-star reviews on iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play and everywhere else podcasts are that you would like to rate us. That also helps us out a lot. So keep that in mind as well. Um, but as far as our amazing patrons that are supporting us financially, we would like to thank them by name, the ones who are at the level where we plug something for them every podcast. We don't have any new patrons for the week, so we're going to skip that part. But we do have Marissa Alexa McCool, who 
would like us to plug her new podcast, We Too, which is kind of um, an expansion on the Me Too campaign about, you know, raising awareness for sexual assault and sexual violence and harassment, things like that. She takes a story and every week we'll read a new one on her podcast that people submit, you know, they submit their stories and she reads a new story every week. It's very interesting and it makes you realize you're not alone, (laughs) especially for us women who most of us have dealt with these situations and sometimes it can just feel good to know that we're not alone in our experiences and that there are other people out there who can understand. So you can check that out. And also she has a new book called Passing Cars. And she actually sent me that book. I read a little blurb from it last week. So if you want to hear a little bit of the book, you can go to last week's episode. So um, I'm also going to continue to find the little bits that I would like to read on the air. So stay tuned for that. Another patron we'd like to thank is Rich Kemp, and Rich would like to plug Recovering from Religion, which is an awesome organization that helps people who are either doubting or leaving their faith and just need support in doing that. So you can go to recoveringfromreligion.org to get more information about that. Another patron who we would like to thank tonight is Christopher, and Christopher would like to plug um, Tri-State Freethinkers. And that's actually a group that Patrick and I are a part of, as we've mentioned in past episodes. And I am actually a brand new board member for them. We just I just um, had my first board meeting with them on Saturday, and I'm super excited for what this year holds and the awesome stuff that we're going to do as a group in the tri-state area, tri-state being Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. The work that they do is amazing. And if you live nearby, you should definitely get involved. So you can find more information about them at tristatefreethinkers.com. They actually have a meeting coming up next month in February. I think it's February 7th. We actually have a meeting coming up next month on February 7th called I Want Your Sex, Not Your Discrimination, which, first of all, that title is amazing. (laughs) Um, I love it. But um, during that meeting, they're going to be talking about the fairness campaign, um, LGBT non-discrimination ordinances. Callie Wright's going to be doing a talk. And we love Callie Wright, of course. Um, so yeah, it'll be really cool. If you're in the area, you should absolutely make it out for that meeting. Otherwise you can catch it on YouTube at Tri-State Freethinkers. They have a YouTube page where they post all of our, um, speakers and events and things like that. And lastly, but not least, I'd like to thank Thomas Smith, who has continued to be a supporter of our show He is the host of Serious Inquiries Only and Opening Arguments. And Serious Inquiries Only is the show that he would like us to talk about. It's um, a podcast where Thomas takes a critical thinking look at science, politics, religion, and really anything that's just relevant and kind of current (laughs) event-ish or just, you know, relevant to those topics and he'll bring on really interesting guests and um, really takes a deep dive into some of these subjects, which is really cool to listen to and get a deeper understanding of um, some of the topics that he covers. So check all of them out. And if you have any questions or want to contact me or Patrick, you can find us at Facebook.com slash Real Life Beyond Faith. We're on Twitter um, at RLBF Pod. You can also email us, Real Life Beyond Faith at gmail.com. And then, of course, you can go over to Patreon and become a patron of our show or even just listen to the episodes there if that is convenient for you. So take care guys thank you so much for listening this week and we'll catch you next time the next time patrick will be with us but in the meantime keep it real